Hey, welcome back. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBT Q&A, where we get to know different members of the LGBTQ community. Today, I'm talking to Kristen Russo. Kristen is the co-author of the book, This is a Book for Parents of Gay Kids. She also runs a website, everyoneisgay.com. Stay tuned. Hey, Kristen. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, of course. I'm excited to talk. Before we get to it, though, uh, we just want to say very briefly to those people at home, um, please rate us and subscribe on iTunes. That is the best way for people to find us. Also, Insider Secret, the comments don't have to be that long on <laughs> iTunes. They just need to be there and exist. So thank you for that. Okay, Kristen. Yes. Uh, I want to first talk about A Camp, if that's okay. Of course. I almost wore my A Camp t-shirt to this very interview. Oh, my God. So you're <laughs> the co-director of A Camp. I am. For people who don't know anything that we're talking about. Can you just give the brief summation of what it is? Sure, yeah. So A Camp uh, began, not, I think, five years ago, but they're in their ninth camp, this camp coming oh, wow. up. And so Autostraddle is the biggest site for queer women uh, that exists, and A Camp is sort of a derivative of Autostraddle. It's the in-person Autostraddle, basically. And so it's a sleepaway camp for adults, uh, 18 people who are 18 and older can come, and it's usually five nights, uh, six days, about that. Uh, has been historically in California, but we did just do a Midwest A Camp this last time. And it's, uh, you know, centers women's experience but welcoming of um, also obviously queer women and trans women, um, but also non-binary folks and trans men. Uh, gender is very complicated. So those are conversations that we always have as well um, with yeah. ACAMP. You make a big point to say um, trans people are welcome, non-binary people are welcome. Right. Not and welcome, I, but included. Immensely. Right. And I hesitate, like whenever I say, whenever I talk about um, gender and ACAMP, it's always like a little bit of a tricky thing because I say we center women's experiences. And I know that trans, trans women's experiences are women's experiences. But but I also like to kind of underline that when I speak about it because, you know, I, I want to make sure that people understand that we look, that we, that's our belief. And I think that like where we are today, you have to make that distinction, right? Right, right. I mean, I wish, right, I wish we didn't have to. I wish that when I said women, you knew what I meant, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. but not everybody does. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's, that's like a little snapshot of what camp is. And generally it's full of programming. I mean, everything from like shibari rope bondage to centering trans women at queer women's spaces to, you know, making avocado jewelry literally like those are those are all the things that i said were actual panels and workshops at camp <laughs> okay hold up stop the interview what does an avocado jewelry look like well you use polymer clay now i'm not the arts and crafts expert so don't you sure know, but uh use polymer clay and you make basically a tiny avocado where you like put the pit in first then the like light green avocado fruit and then the dark skin and then you cut it in half and you make jewelry like you make a set of earrings where it's like a half of avocado in each oh that's so funny or you do a little necklace like you know Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, nothing inherently queer about it, actually. Just fun arts and crafts. Well, it's the same right? thing about like how nothing is inherently queer about being vegan. And yet, <laughs> right. you know, many of us. It's okay. Right. Right. Um, but I have so many friends that go to a camp and just the way their faces light up after it, they're just shell-shocked at it's, the experience. I mean, honestly, so I went up to A-Camp, I think three years ago was my first A-Camp, and I went as a special guest. I went to do talks in a panel and, and what have you. And I remember being really skeptical. Like, I was like, I don't know. I'm not the, I wasn't the kind of person, so I thought, to go to the top of a mountain with 300 other queer people and spend a week together doing, making avocado jewelry. Like, I was just like, what is this thing? And I went up with my wife, uh, who's a musician, so she was also a special guest. And we were both like one eyebrow raised. We left, and first of all, Jenny, my wife, she cried every single day we were there, looking at the experience that people were having. It's just the most powerful thing. Uh, it, it's a space that so many people cannot access. I mean, it's a space that none of us can access on a daily basis, but for so many people, they come from places where they might not even have another queer person in their orbit, and suddenly they have everyone around them who is identifying, you know, in some way, tangentially to them. And it's just, it's very, very powerful. And I left the mountain that year, and I said to Reese, who uh, is the CEO of Autostraddle, I will come back every year. If, if you want me here, fine. If you don't, I don't care. I'm coming back every year. And it just so happened that that year, 
year, one of the two co-directors stepped down. And so Reese was like, hey, remember that thing you said about <laughs> coming back every year? Uh, do you want to be the co-director? And wow. I was like, uh, yeah, I'm going to do this thing. I I'm so glad you said that about the raised eyebrow, because I could hear kind of like a little bit of groans like in the, our audience. Um, there are live audience, which does not exist. Right. But, you know, the people <laughs> listening, I can yeah. hear them being like, camp, like what? Right. Like s'mores? Right. And totally, by the way, yes, s'mores. <laughs> but right, it's it's... I, I think that it's so necessary because historically when you, queer spaces mm -hmm. are people who like look like me, they're white and they're cis and they're gay and there is a, there is a woman. And right. it's not like the most inviting place, it can't, can't be the most inviting place for women. So for, to have like a, something like this, a space. Right. And even like, you know, even if you went to sleepaway camp as a kid and, you know, regardless of what your experience is there, if you, if you were queer or trans or however you identify, going to sleepaway camp or going to any kind of camp usually is a pretty othering experience, you know, and you're like sharing a room with other people and you're wondering, are you different from those people? So there is something very um, incredible about how a camp really reclaims that space for queer people and says like, this is like, we, he, we're here, we're all queer uh, and we're sharing this space and we're gonna like educate ourselves about things and we're gonna have a blast. And you know, there's, a, there's an after, like a dance that happens every night that's like unofficial programming called Club Deer. And it happens after the evening programming. And it's like a dance club on a mountain or in Wisconsin or wherever we happen to be that year that starts at like 11 o'clock at night and people have some drinks and they dance and there's a DJ every night. It's just, it's really fun and beautiful. It's really a beautiful thing. That's amazing. Yeah. I can't help drawing the comparison to a fire island, you yeah. know, for like women and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, to be able to access Fire Island, you, you need to be like a certain like level of uh, affluence. Yeah. Um, is that the same thing with A Camp? I mean, you know, there is a cost to A Camp, but there's also we're working harder and harder to have more camperships every year. And A Camp is kept. The cost is so low. You know, you get your meals, you get seven, you know, or six days of lodging and on and on and on. So the cost is low, but it's still a cost. And yeah. especially if you're traveling on top of that. So um, we have people every year who donate full camperships and we're able to to then give those camperships to people who apply for them. And uh, this year we started a fund specifically to support um, trans campers and people of color, and specifically trans people of color um, to come to camp who, you know, oftentimes don't have the means to make that tuition or make those dues or what have you. Um, and it's been really incredible. And we are able to connect those campers as well to the special guests we have, the artists we have, the musicians we have, um, who then help cultivate them and their artistic endeavors um, uh, so that they go back out into the world and they're like, I just, you know, I just learned about writing a song or I just learned about editing this video or, you know, whatever the case may be. So we're trying to build up the community so that we have more people uh, putting out creative work, too, because that's especially in this day and age, a lot of what's sustaining so many of us. Yeah. And the, the connections that people leave with are crazy. Yeah. Be, it, be it career connections, but also just friendships. Right. I mean, best. And that's. You know, I, I have to give Reese a shout out on on making those connections because Reese spends at least a month every single camp with all of the uh, people who are coming, all the campers, looking at their interests and their survey questions and meticulously pairing them in their logic, like where they stay and who, who their fellow campers are to overlap with interests. So you'll have like a cabin full of people who love Harry Potter, you know, and a cabin full of people who just cannot stop talking about their cat and a cabin full of people who are all in the tech industry. Um, and so not only are they meeting other queer people, but they're meeting people who share common interests, which I think is a lot of the reason that people leave with such incredible friendships, wow. too. That's yeah. so cool. I saw that one of the classes that they had was lesbian sexual health. Mm -hmm. And I think that's amazing. But it also made me really sad because it was like a reality check that yeah. we are adults and we still need this because we still have questions. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, just as people in the world, I think we all like exit high school being like, so what does my body do? Like just in yeah. general. But certainly if you compound that by being a queer person, you have usually no access to information about like your body and how your body relates to other people's bodies uh, and how to be safe when yeah. your bodies are, you know, in relation to each other. And so it is, it's, I mean, it is, right? The root of it is sad that we don't have that, that we don't give that to, to young people, but it is really powerful that we get the chance to educate each other and that we take that initiative and go yeah. hard with it. A and when it is an LGBTQ sex ed focus class, you can talk about trans and gender nonconforming bodies yes. too. Yes. Which w you can't even talk about like uh, uh, same sex couple sex, let alone trans people. No, no. I mean, right. I mean, out in and the normal 
assholes. <laughs> right, of course. And because out, out in the world of most schools, I, I will give credit that there are some schools out there that are doing the right thing, but you know, everything sort of operates on a binary, right? You are a boy or a girl, and whichever one you are, you like the other one, and that is the safe sex that we need to teach you about. Yeah. It's so silly because like for a long time when I was first getting involved in community work and what have you, I talked about it like there was like straight sex and gay sex. <laughs> and like, you know, long enough having that conversation when you're in queer communities, you learn, well, no, this is ridiculous. There's not gay sex and straight sex. There's sex, right? Like we all do things with our bodies and they interact with, e with each other in various ways. And it's so easy to take that like uh, sex education and just take the gendered terms out of it and say like, all it is is just like, you've got fluids and I've got fluids. Like yeah. keep them away from each other. <laughs> you know, like it's just, it's so easy to make it inclusive, which is why it's especially frustrating that historically and you know for the most part it has not been made inclusive yeah th there was an article i read last week oh, it was by uh, john paul brammer he's an nbc outwriter but he also this was on buzzfeed mm -hmm. and it was about an early sexual experience and um which turned into sexual assault and he wrote i didn't know that men could be raped mm. at yeah. that age and that's a recurring theme i hear is from people who grow up and this was a devastating article but people in my life are like oh i didn't realize that this uh, thing i had was rape Totally. And that's because we're missing sex ed. Yes. And and like, I mean, that that transfers over to just domestic violence in general, that queer people are like, well, it's not, you know, we, we put it in our heads. We have it in our heads that, you know, a man can, you know, abuse a woman. Right. A man can rape a woman. And like that's sort of like the only picture that we're given. And so when you're in queer relationships, those lines get really blurry, yeah. which is dangerous. Because we're not also teaching when you don't talk, teach about sex, you also don't teach, teach about consent. Right. Oh, yeah. Consent. I mean, consent is a word that like came into my vocabulary within the last like five years. I yeah. swear. Uh, it was not talked about at all. Right. It, it, like telling people they are able to say no. And then also the verse of that is that you are able to say yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like the, you know, the, yes. it's not slut shaming. You want it to say yes. But uh, it's like I missed that completely for me. Yeah. Same. And also when you miss sex ed, you don't talk about HIV and STDs, mm -hmm. which for communities of color and trans communities are still a crazy rights. Right, right. And and that's another issue that like in the world at large, I feel like the conversation around HIV and AIDS is like, oh, that was a problem. Like, yes. it used to be a problem. And like, granted, we've made incredible advances. And I'm, you know, very aware of those things. And that's wonderful. But we can't just start talking about this thing like it's not affecting us because it's not affecting like white communities as yeah. much or it's not, you know, or affluent communities like, yeah, it's messed up. And I was reading too, like the stats are like more concentrated in southern states. Mm. And there there's some of these populations that are like it's like 40 percent and it's often people of color yeah and i think that like you said we 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 had the normal heart we published it we see right. revivals we're done <laughs> and it's still <laughs> affecting us like uh, it's deadly yeah yeah it's wild it's still here it's still active and people are still not being taught about their bodies and how their bodies relate to other bodies exactly like, that it's just really the education i mean that's what drives me so nuts about what is happening in our political climate right now is you know just the this uh, rise of the conversation again where we want to take education away and we also want to take access to medicine and tools away like it's just you know i mean i'd be upset if any of these elements were being taken away but the fact that we're taking all of them away and saying like you'll be fine is ludicrous and you know something that of course would be the answer by somebody who is affluent and who is white and who has not had to uh, grapple at all with the fact that there are many other people who don't have access to things yeah. that they do. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Did, did you have did you have sex ed when you were growing up? I had sex ed in high school, and I went to a pretty like I will, my my high school was in upstate New York, and they did a pretty good job overall. But my sex ed was still, you know, this is a penis and this is a vagina, and you know, this is how you put a condom on a penis, and that was pretty much the extent of it. It, it didn't go into anything past that. Wow. Um, and at the time, you know, I mean, I in in high school, I was also very unsure of my own identity. So I was like, okay, I guess I have this information, but it did sort of feel like I was missing a piece. And the fact that that piece was missing was a big signal to me that I shouldn't be thinking about the things that I was thinking about. You yes. Know? Yeah. For me, they said that, um, you know, men will get erections mm -hmm. and you also from your hormones will need to use deodorant. And like that was the entire class. Like the fact that we're spending time on deodorant. Like I'm right. great, great, fine. Like, like I, okay, useful, yes, but right, but that's like the curriculum. 
Yeah. It's just it's just so lacking. And right, no, there was no discussion of like consent or safety right. or anything like that. It was like, don't do this thing, but if you do this thing, here's a piece of latex that you can use to like you know what I mean? It was just very it was there, so I will be yeah. thankful that I got anything because I know a lot of people don't or people get like abstinence only and all this other stuff. But yeah, it was frustrating. I, I lived in New York for, fi in, I lived in New York State for my whole life up until a year and a half ago, but I lived in New York City for 15 years. And the first work that I really did with LGBTQ communities was I volunteered at the Hetrick Martin Institute, which is the home of the Harvey Milk High School. Uh, and it's basically after school programming for LGBTQ youth from the five boroughs um, and pointedly uh, homeless youth and at risk youth. And I remember being just floored by the sex positivity in their programming. You know, I went in as like, I don't know, maybe I was 24 or 23 or something. Uh, and they were, it was Valentine's Day and they were like handing out condoms to all of the young people. And they were having such frank and honest discussions about what that meant. And the young people themselves were also very comfortable talking about their sexuality. And I just thought like, I'm getting the chills even talking about it now because I was just like, oh my God, like what would the world be like if this, if this picture was the norm, if this is what kids were given in. not only like the tools for safety but the tools to like they owned their bodies those young people like they knew about their bodies and they were able to say yes and no to things because they knew whereas like for me when I was a kid I was like reaching around in the dark like I had no idea what I was doing and also felt like maybe I should or shouldn't be doing things based on the lack of knowledge yeah it's wild that little bubbles of like queer communities like that exist like in just in general yes it's not everywhere clearly but the fact that they exist somewhere yes and they're in these like incredible spaces that you can't always see like you walk by the hedrick martin institute and you don't know if, if you don't know it's there you really don't know that it's there it's i mean especially in new york city it's just another building another brick facade and inside of that structure the most remarkable things are happening and, and what age range was it, were those kids the i think the cap for hedrick martin institute is 21 um and so they're high school age so i think like maybe 14 to 21 i hope i'm not getting that wrong they may have changed there but sure. that's the general idea like high school aged um, and they did a lot of GED work as well and so it was like if you were 21 then you aged out of the program but you could be oh, in gotcha. until you were 21. I, I ask because I'm still um, baffled in the best way possible that people are able to identify as queer that early. Right right and I mean I think you know a lot of these young people are uh, that use the Hetrick Martin services and what have you are homeless and that is because they have come out to their families and their families have you know, told them to get out and, yeah. and leave. And so um, the awareness that they have is really, really incredible. But then like to also think about being that age, being so young and knowing that about yourself and, and having the courage to say that out loud and then being met with um, met with that, met with like sort of get out of our house. That's You're not wild. my child. Like, and, and with good education, we were talking about consent earlier and mm -hmm. saying yes and no. The other end of that spectrum is teaching people that they need to seek consent, right? <laughs> Right. That That is almost the bigger problem. Yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. I think it is because that is just, an, and that's my, my whole living life. Like I didn't know that. Yeah. I, like I, you know, maybe inherently that would make sense, but it never, ever, ever was taught to me that people should ask for things before doing those things. Yeah. You know, I did. Uh, yeah. And I, that's a huge gap. And the fact that alcohol factors into it and makes your uh, you, decision-making like not able to give consent, right, right. that's not something that I heard until like midway through college. Totally. And instinctually, sure, I hopefully knew that, but I it was never said in well, words. But, right, and instinctually, I knew it to a point, but certainly I, that, that line is still very blurry to me because I spent my entire like adolescence and through college and what have you, like going to bars and having a drink to, you know, to hook up, to meet somebody. And so now like with this new knowledge, it's been, I mean, still it's like an ongoing conversation in my life of like, where are those lines and how do we draw them and how do we experience things with other people in a way that's safe and also fun, uh, you know, safe and also sexy and and yeah i mean i'm i'm 36 years old so i feel like a lot of these conversations for in my life are happening when i'm an adult like i've gone through so much i can't imagine what life would have been like had i had those conversations at 16 18 even 25 yeah Wow. And then you, so you came out as bisexual and then as lesbian <laughs> yes. and then back as bisexual. Yes, I have come out as so many things. Um, I started, so I came out as bisexual because that, that was like truly what I believe my identity to be. I mean, we're talking 1997 or eight, I think 1990. Let's see, I came 
1998, because it was the Thanksgiving in my freshman year of college. So I came out in 1998, and in 1998, I had no understanding of gender past the binary at all. So when I said- I, I think many people did not either. Right, I mean, I, I knew I was attracted to boys and girls, and that seemed clear enough to me, like, perfect, there's a word for me, I am bisexual. And so that is how I came out. And the biggest reason that I came out as a lesbian a couple of years later was because my mom would not let go of the fact that there was a chance that I would be with a man. Oh. And so it was less about that I was like no longer attracted to men and much more about just shutting her up. About saying like, you know what, I'm gonna cut off this option for you because you're not dealing with the reality here and you're putting all of your focus on the what ifs instead of the, the other reality in my life, which is that I am attracted to women and I am dating women and on and on. And so I came out as a lesbian and, and you know, came, my big coming out was bisexual. I more like re, like re explained to my mom, like no more of this, we're gonna do this. But it was also around the same time as like the L word and like a lot of things that were big markers in lesbian culture. And so I became very afraid within that identity with my friends that I was gonna meet a guy and have a crush on this guy and start dating a guy and that I didn't know what was going to happen. Like for me personally and also with my friends. Oh, socially. Socially, I just thought like they will freak. It was not, and not that this doesn't exist anymore, this totally exists, but I feel like especially in the early 2000s, when you were part of a lesbian crew of people, it was not okay for you to all of a sudden be dating a man. I mean, everyone would have looked at me like I had 14 heads, you know? So I was very, very worried about that. It did not happen. My fear did not happen. Uh, though I did have crushes on a couple of guys that I really kept secret uh, during that time. And then more recently, and then I, I learned the word queer, and that was really cool. I went to um, grad school and have my master's degree in gender studies, and so I really got to unpack words and terms. Is that when you first learned the word queer? It is. Oh, well, that's amazing. It's not when I first learned the word. Like, I knew that the word existed, but I didn't understand that the word was, like, being used by the community and in, in this really powerful way and strong way. I just knew queer yeah. as, like, a thing that maybe some people had called, like, my best friend in high school. Like, not, you know yeah. what I mean? I, I feel like I'm throwing queer down people's throats because it acknowledges our entire breadth of, like, differences yes. and a spectrum within one word mm -hmm. and uh, I'm such the biggest advocate for it me too I love uh, queer is my favorite of all the words same my, because it because it inspires conversation right it's like when I tell you I'm queer usually if you don't know much about the community you're like well what what does that mean is that a bad word is that a good word and you get to have all these like really interesting conversations so queer and I still use queer to identify myself but um, within the last couple of years I remember maybe three years ago two years ago um, I think it was HRC they put out a study that was specific to the bisexual community. Um, and it really was very eye-opening to me. I knew, I mean, I had lived life as a bisexual for a while, and I knew that there were all sorts of complications that come being erased, you know, by the non-queer community, but also by your own community. And, but seeing the like statistics on the page really shook me. And I, at the time I had everyone as gay and you know, I had people who looked to me and followed me on Twitter and things like that. And I thought, you know, I'm not doing a service by not using this word because this is a word that is true to my understanding of myself. And I really claimed it for that purpose more than anything else was that I knew that, that I was visible in a sense and that the people who I was visible to needed representations of themselves. And I, you know, at the time was in a, long-term relationship and now I'm married to a woman and I think that's really important that like I'm married to a woman and I'm still saying I'm bisexual people yeah. need to see more of that yep. and, and more people who are you know identifying as women and in relationships with men who identify as bisexual yeah because both are valid yeah. when you say you reclaim the word the word bisexual we're mm -hmm. saying yes okay. bisexual for myself I, totally. for, I did it's amazing that in terms of bi erasure which is a big problem especially in terms of representation that it's due to societal pressures that that kept you more or less in the closet yeah. as a lesbian. Right, right, as a lesbian. I was terrified that I might be, you know, interested in a man. Wow. For, 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 you know, the social reasons that I talk about, but also because of my family. I had put in so much work to get my family to, at that point, you know, my mom still wasn't even 100% accepting, but I had got, I'd worked so hard to get her to accept me or accept that piece of me that I felt like I knew that if I brought a guy home, 
my whole history would have been erased. She would have never seen any of the things that came before as valid and true. She would have seen it as like a phase or something that was just, I had to get through it to get to the real me. And that was devastating, that idea that that, you know, that that all could be erased. Because even if I had wound up in a, you know, a relationship with a man or married to a man, the relationships that I had with women were real and true and beautiful and would never have been invalidated. Right, and you'd still be bisexual. Right, right. Uh, so it was just to kind of like kill her like last bit of hope. Yeah, <laughs> let, yes. let her get over it. And she needed it. She needed it. But, you know, looking back on it, hindsight, right? But like looking back on it, I do wonder, you know, should I have taken the longer road and just like gone the harder road and, and really stuck with that term? Because she still doesn't have a hundred percent understanding of bisexual and like raises an eyebrow when I claim that word now. You know, it's hard for her to unpack that. And, and I feel like that's just going to kind of like life for that generation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, they. You know, I had the binary for, I don't know, 15 to 20 years of my life. My mom has had only the binary concepts in her life for 50, 60 years. So yeah. it's it's really hard. It, yeah, and in doing this show, we've had a lot of bisexuals on um, lately, mm -hmm. um, just kind of by coincidence. <laughs> um, but a recurring theme I see is that people are more accepting of you being attracted to a different gender, be it the, um, uh, of being gay or lesbian and yes. less accepting of you being attracted to multiple genders. Yes. Yes. And that they cannot get grasp. Well, because I mean, I think people are still really struggling to grasp that there are more than two genders right. alone, let alone that, that that like attraction might mean, especially the word bisexual. Like, you know, there's there was so much contention around the word bisexual for so long and still is because people are like, well, bi, that means two. So are you not attract, you know, are you excluding other gender identities? And, you know, my understanding, and I think a lot of the community's understanding of the word now is that it means, you know, attracted to genders like our own and other genders, so yeah. that's the that's the buy. But yeah, I do think that people, I mean, non-binary identities and um, you know just identities that are somewhere outside of that binary in any way are not understood by so many people and not talked about. And I, you know, I have a small project that I do called Our Restroom which is an initiative to try to get businesses to put all gender signs on their bathrooms when they're single stall. It's like the easiest thing to do and it's a really powerful thing to do. And I cannot explain to you the resistance that I am met with with some of these conversations where people are so like, you seem really nice, but I don't want to like buy your product. And I'm like, there's no product to buy. Like, there's no product to buy. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just trying to tell you. But there's, it's like very much like, I don't know. I actually, I can't get in their heads and explain what it is, but there's just a lack of understanding about the lived reality of these human beings, right. you know, it's it's like this fringe thing in their mind, whereas that's not at all the case. In, in, in terms of our restroom, you're actually not even asking for total understanding or acceptance. You're just asking for a very easy task that would make the life easier of a lot of people. Right. For for, for people who are non-binary and for like tons of other humans, yeah. you know, maybe just from a line example, you know, you don't have a line outside of one door and not the other. <laughs> like there's so many like practical applications for it that it it seems so simple and yet there is just, we have a lot of work to do yeah. in educating people. And there are also people who uh, are not non-binary, but they present in yes. gender non-conforming ways. Yes. And it's even unsafe for them. Right. And they're like, but I'm cis. Completely, <laughs> completely. I mean, yeah. I, you know, for the first five years of Everyone is Gay, I worked with Danielle Owens Reed and we would tour the country. And, you know, Danielle didn't identify as non-binary, um, but her presentation was androgynous, maybe is the best uh, word for it. And we would wind up all over the country at rest stops, at places where we'd have to use the bathroom, and there was an issue of safety. We were always concerned. I would never, ever let her go into the bathroom by herself. We would always go as a pair. And, you know, that's an experience that, right, it, I'm, I'm putting the focus on non-binary individuals, yeah. and that's actually not accurate at all because there's yeah. so many others as well. And I, and I guess I don't want to center cis people in that discussion, but of um, it, but I think I love this, our restroom, because it's, it's easy for right? these small business owners. Right. It's so easy. It is. And, and we've had, you know, I shouldn't say it hasn't all been in a fight. Of Some course. businesses are like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I didn't realize. And they changed their signs. But I've just been, it's been eye opening in ways that I didn't expect at this point. I've worked with, you know, LGBTQ communities for so long that I 
don't expect to be still surprised and yet around every door there's still something new yeah and I, I'm, I'm laughing because we are adults you know discussing things that we still have questions about and then and that kind of leads us to your website everyone is gay for mainly kids to ask questions yeah it's I mean you know it, it ranges but I would say that it's usually like young people people in high school even middle school and then in, through like mid-20s because there's a lot of relationship advice oh, on really? everyone is gay yeah so, and so this is where people can submit questions anonymously yes uh, and so are you is the majority of, of questions about relationships or like coming out yes. like what are you saying I would say so relationships and coming out are the top two by far um, coming out to parents like high up in the coming out list and crushes on best friends super high up on the relationship end of the questions. I mean, li literally, I think every person is in love with their best friend. I, I statistically, you know, we, I don't know how many questions we have submitted at this point, but I want to say that like a fifth of the questions are wow. all, I'm, you know, people and people know now they submit and it's like, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I know you've gotten this question before, but like my situation is specific and like, here's what my best friend love looks like and what do I do? Oh my God. And of course you don't know them, so you can't give a specific example or uh, advice, I'm sure. Right. I mean, you know, there, there are standard pieces of advice, I think, that apply. Like, I, I always encourage people to really consider being honest about it, because I think that there's this idea that if we admit our feelings, that our relationship to that person will change. But the reality is that, like, you have the feelings. So the relationship has changed, and it's very hard to sort of step backwards and get back to a place without somehow going through that process. It's different for everyone. Of but, course. Um, I do think sometimes that honesty is the best policy where not that you're saying like, will you date me necessarily, but that you're saying like, I have these feelings and like, I know that's complicated, but I need to put them on the table and maybe we can have a conversation about them and maybe things are going to be weird for like a month, six months. I don't know. Yeah. But you're kind of like moving through an honest space then. I know. Uh, your, your face is no, like, I don't know, Kristen. No, I know what you mean. I know you mean. <laughs> it's of terrifying. Course. No, I think that's great advice. It is scary though. No, I, I guess my face was um, going in the back of my head because um, I wanted to ask if you or how much you've seen Trump in the election reflected in these questions from people? Uh, you know, there was like a big spike at when the election happened. And, and that's still present. I mean, I think that a huge uh, piece of the conversation that everyone is gay for a long time and then still threaded in has been around families and Trump. And, and I've gone through that personally, too, having family members who have voted for this person uh, and you know, having, you know, in the back of your mind, you kind of know, you knew that you were, that you'd have issues with this family member anyway, but you kind of didn't have to, especially if you were a cis white person, uh, you didn't have to face it as much. And I went through that with my family where I knew I fought the good fight for a little while. And then I kind of was like, I can't do this anymore. And I took a step back. Some of that you, you need to do. But in the wake of the election, I remember thinking, how has this happened? Like, I didn't think that I thought I was making progress with my extended family. I thought that little by little, right, they were seeing me and my wife. They were, and and the election really just pulled that entire rug out from under me to say, like, no, they weren't making progress. That wasn't what that was. That was just, like, tacit, you know, like, we'll be okay with you over there and we'll be over here kind of a situation. And so there were a lot of conversations that happened after the election that were similar to that, where people's parents, uh, especially young people, you know, I have the leisure of being in my own space, my own city, my own, you know, and a lot of young people who are in high school still, middle school even, are living with their family members who have voted this person into office who they know does not care about their safety or their protection. And that's really complicated. It's really hard. I mean, there isn't, a, there isn't an easy answer for it. Yeah. And more and more, I'm aware of the great privilege of living in this particular city mm -hmm. in California and the ability to, for safety. Right. And, and also the ability to surround myself by like-minded people. Yes. Yes. Which so much, I mean, there is so much safety in that, um, in having, just having, and that's what I, I said to so many young people in the first months after the election was, make sure you have, you keep your friends close, right? Keep your friends on your phone, what, however it is that you talk to those people, have those conversations regularly so that you're not just hearing this one side of the conversation. Like you kind of, you have to feel seen multiple times in the day, I think, to survive. And if, you know, right, we have the luxury of being in an urban area where there are centers you can go to and find actual bodies uh, who are like-minded like you. Um, but even if you are not in a city that has, you know, those resources that like we, we do have the internet, we do have phones and methods of contacting each other. And I really think that that kind of 
being seen yeah. is what holds us up in those really dark times. I think that's great. How, how do you address issues when you hear from kids and there's child abuse involved? Those are issues that like we've never had anyone. Oh, really? Yeah. So, so our inbox is anonymous and we really, I think that I've seen maybe one or two things come in, but the problem is that I can't answer that person um, privately. So, you know, we would at most point them to resources that are not ours. Like that's that's the way that we handle that. Gotcha. Um, pretty much hard stuff. We've had guest writers before. We've had people from the Trevor Project write in, um, you know, give answers to people who have been feeling suicidal and things like that. But um, the issue with uh, anything abuse related is that I can't contact that person, and I also am not, you know, just due to the, due to the makeup of the site. Right. Right. Oh, I because see. Tumblr, and, that, and that's like, you know, it's it's a, a blessing and a curse. Though I do think for the most part it's more a blessing. But the reason that we get the questions that we get is because they know that nobody will know who's asking it. And so it opens up this space to feel comfortable saying, yeah. you know, I'm dating this girl and this weird thing happened when we were making out. I don't know what it means. Or, you know, from that to, to coming out um, and to feeling unsafe. But the um, the downside to that is that we can, we don't have access to the people submitting. So we can't say like, hey, this is something that like crosses boundaries um, and we need to like, you know, alert a thought or anything like that. I, we've never had anything come oh, into uh, our inbox. Oh, uh, that surprises me to be honest. Yeah, that that has been like, what do we do? Um, and I, th I mean, I think that it's because we're very, very clear on the site of who we are and what we do, right? We're not therapists. We're not like, this is not, we're like people who are living our lives and we have like experience here and there. And it's mostly relationship and coming out. Um, very, uh, very seldomly does it cross lines um, of concern. There are uh, definitely emails that come in where people are feeling suicidal. Self-harm is something that comes up in the inbox. But those are things that um, we do have resources for and that we can point people to. Yeah, hopefully they're contacting the Trevor Project. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Wow. I mean, the Trevor Project uh, number has been put across our dashboard so, 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 so many times. Um, whether in response to a question or just like, hey, reminder, this is here and this is important for you to know. Yeah, 24 hours a day and anonymous as well. Right. And that's, that's I mean, that's everything. The anonymity is so key for people. So yeah. you don't want to, whether you're asking a simple question about your relationship or you're asking a really personal question about your family or yourself, you really, there's very, very few people who have um, the ability to ask that and know that their name is going to be attached to that. It's scary. Yeah. It's amazing that you're in the like question and answer um, job, especially like with your book as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Instead of as a QA. and a Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, it's such a, you know, the book uh, is set up so that you can kind of dip in and dip out and you can take the advice that you need because, pe you know, every parent is different when yeah. the kid comes out to them. It warms my heart though to know that there are people seeking out how do I best support my uh, LGBTQ child. There are are so many people and they are so wonderful. I mean, it, it has been so heartwarming of a journey to go on because for a long time, I mean, it was already heartwarming dealing with like, you know, talking to young people and, and having conversations, you know, then when I would visit schools and things like that in person. But when it came to turning that corner and starting to have those conversations with parents, because it's personal to me too, you know, I went through so much with my mom, especially. And so seeing parents reach out and, and try to do good by their kid is, it's just everything because you know it's there as, as a queer person you know what it does to have the support of your parent yeah uh, or parents and it was a big realization to realize that this is difficult for them as well it is not as difficult as for you but it's it, it's difficult yes they have to come out they have to figure it out right and, and they don't have tools for that yeah i mean my mom had no, zero zero tools for that what so you come from a very religious family i do yeah Ca my, Catholicism? Mm -hmm, my mom i mean both of my parents are catholic but my mom was raised super catholic oh wow what was the biggest factor in her eventual acceptance of you and your wife was it time <sighs> the, yeah time was the single biggest factor for sure but also i was very open at varying points to dialoguing with her, to having conversations with her, to answering her questions and to like allowing her to come back with more questions, even when sometimes those questions were really frustrating. So we had 10 years of conversation. Um, but my mom also, I made a video with my mom, I think within the last like year, year and a half about this because she was really grappling with things. We were having conversations. A big thing was that she met my girlfriend at the time, and that was big, like, for her to see the actual relationship instead of the idea in her yeah. head of what that might look like. 
And then my mom got really sick. She like went into the hospital to have her gallbladder removed and there was something horrible happened during the surgery and she almost didn't make it out. She was in ICU for like a month and a half and in recovery for like a month and a half. And it was when I was, I think like 21 because it was right around 9-11. It was like my whole world just came like crashing down in a span of months. And that was huge for her because she came out of that thinking, I could have just died and I would not have had the relationship to my daughter that I would have had had I listened and accepted and opened my heart to her. And so, I, I mean, I wish that my mom did not have to go through what she went through, but she talks about it a lot that like, she's very thankful for pieces of it because she came out of that hospital and she was like, cause she has seven sisters and many of them were really on her back and still on her back about her acceptance or leniency with me or whatever. And she came out of that hospital like back off just like this is my kid and I love my kid and I will not hear this anymore and it, it was a turning point for her you know the conversations didn't stop there for sure but I think it was like all of a sudden her resolve was like wait this is messed up and I'm not going to listen any I'm not going to listen like um listen blindly is not the correct combination <laughs> of words but you know what I'm saying of course uh she, she wasn't just going to take words at face value anymore it was so it was her family her sisters that were advocating for like not talking to you more or less i mean they didn't ever ask her to not talk to me but they very much felt that like any acceptance any allowance of people in my life was like allowing me to go down this path further wow. and what's remarkable and there's a lot of i mean i don't know if you've ever heard hypocrisy connected to catholicism no but... never <laughs> But what was so hypocritical about the experience, and some of these uh, same things were echoed with the election, uh, was that during the time when I was coming out to my mom, my one of my aunts said, go to a priest, right? That's what you have to do. So my mom did. My mom went to our parish priest in upstate New York, Father Tom. And Father Tom said to my mother, uh, your daughter must love you so much that she trusted you enough to share this important piece of herself with you. And the one piece of advice he gave to my mom was never shut your door to your daughter or anyone who your daughter brings home, right? So my mom was like, oh, like this was, this was better than anything I could have ever said. This was better than anything that most people could say. This was a priest and to my mom, that's everything. And my aunt who had told her to do this said, well, you need to go to a different priest. Right? You need to go to a different, like, it's just so, you think she didn't get the answer she wanted and that she believed in. And so she had no ability to actually listen to this incredible priest, a priest I will never forget, who helped my mom immensely that for the, those first few months. That is so heartwarming to hear that there are priests out there like that. There are, there are. I mean, you, you know, you usually hear the other side of, of, course. of the coin, but there really are brilliant, wonderful minds within the Catholic church who understand. I mean, my, my parents belong to still a Catholic church in upstate New York, a different church because we moved. And during the election, this was the, the echoing story, um, my aunt said, you go and you find out what your priest says about you voting for Hillary. And my, my mom's priest and the nun were like, we're both voting for Hillary too. And she was like, well, what about abortion, right? Because that, that's like the key issue. And they were like, well, you have to take the full picture into consideration when you do these things and blah, 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 blah. And, and once again, my aunt was like, I don't, I don't trust these people. <laughs> like, <laughs> Wow. <laughs> but those people, you know, I say I told that additional story just to kind of underline the fact that like there there is good stuff happening um, in some Catholic churches. And, you know, there are people who are Catholic who um, I think use their head along with their religion in combination to, to be really beautiful human beings and to give back to this world. And like, you know, I mean, I, I have my personal Haunt, like, you know, limitations with Catholicism because I was brought up inside of it. So it's complicated for me, but I do very much know that there are people who, who are Catholic who uh, are doing really incredible things. Yeah. And, and I never want to knock religion because it gives people so much good. And then again, it also causes so much violence to people. Right. But there's just so many misconceptions and mm -hmm. misunderstandings. And unfortunately, it goes to whoever is like in charge of your specific parish or church. Yes, yes, completely, completely. And I, I mean, I've had a long journey with, with religion. And I, 
if you have not uh, heard of this human being, there is a um, Reverend Broderick Greer, who I believe is based out of like the DC area at this point, but I don't know because he's moved a couple of times. Have you ever heard I've of Broderick? Not. He is brilliant, and I bring his name up especially if anyone is listening to this and who's sort of like struggling with like religion and sexuality. Um, I interviewed Broderick. Broderick wrote for Everyone Is Gay years ago, and um, I got to, the chance to interview him on a series that I did with um, PBS Digital called First Person, and um, so you. You can access some of those things out there, but he um, is just this brilliant reverend, I believe in the Episcopal um, faith, and is so steeped in the intersections of sexuality, gender identity, race, religion, and speaks so beautifully in a way that I think really welcomes people who have felt really burned by um, what they've seen in their own faith practices and, and stuff like that. So he's just a, he's a real... He's a real badass. Fantastic. What does your faith look like today? You know, my faith, I, I love I love churches. Um, I am a New Yorker, though I've been in Los Angeles for the last year and a half. And But for my time in New York, I would go to empty churches. There's, you know, there's such beautiful churches in New York that are so old and cavernous and wonderful. Um, and so I find a lot of my spiritual moments in, like, that silence and that quiet. Uh, and I pray. I mean, I don't pray regularly, but um, my wife and I both, if, um, you know, if we're really going through something or if we're really confused about something, she'll often look at me and say, like, have we gotten to this point? Like, do you want to pray right now? And we will. And so, like, you know, we'll pray together. But I don't really adhere to, you know, a particular, like, if you say, like, what are you? Like, I don't, I don't, I say, like, well, I'm Catholic, right? I was raised Catholic, almost, like, culturally. Um, and I, I view myself as a Christian in some sense, but I don't really follow any routines or traditions or anything like that. I sort of um, operate. Uh, my own on my own path and I also have done yoga for a really long time and really appreciate you my my entry back into grad school was actually me wanting to study religion and sexuality in conjunction with each other I realized very quickly that there were a lot of religion students who knew like eight languages and I was really just not uh, as, as experienced as I would have liked to have been to get a master's in it but um, learning about other religions outside of Christianity was a fascinating time in my life to realize oh so many of these like monotheistic religions are telling Telling the same stories, and yet here we are on this planet, just like fighting each other. Yeah. For who has ownership of the correct story? Are you kidding? It's just so silly. The whole thing is so silly. That's a really <laughs> amazing and surprising image to have two married women praying together. Mm -hmm. To be honest. And it's not something that like we really talk about, right? Yeah. It's not like you would never know that except for you, because you're a wonderful interviewer. <laughs> Thank you. Just happens, to, you know what I mean? But like, it's not something that what would why would we talk about it really? Yeah. Like it's something that we do at home, but yeah, in private. In private, right? And not and not that like we're trying to hide it, but it's just a it's a thing that you do kind of when you're on your own. And I think all of us have, you know, maybe we're not praying, but we have some things that we do when we're by ourselves to like connect us to something larger, and we need that. I mean, that's why religion is as powerful as it is is because we're human beings and we really need to like hold on to something sometimes yes so yeah um i've let you go thank you so much for being here yeah. um before we go tell everybody what your shirt says <laughs> <laughs> my shirt says queer and forever here i love that <laughs> thank you so much of course and if people want to find out more about you should we send them to your twitter your website yeah, what do you send want? Them, if you can send them to my twitter i mean my name is very uh very easy to spell kristen nolene uh but it's k-r-i-s-t-i-n-n-o-e-l-i-n-e -I -I -N -N -E, and that is both my website my twitter my Instagram you can find me in all those places and then everyone is gay is just everyone is gay uh, <laughs> dot com and on socials yeah and everything we talk about like the book the website is all accessed through your Twitter as well yes um, my Twitter is Jeff Masters one that's the best way to contact me if you guys want to recommend a guest we love hearing from you that way and once again comment on iTunes tell all your friends we'll see you next week <laughs> goodbye from executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.